Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Noor Kokiar, the Executive Director of the Washington State-China Relations Council. We're pleased today to welcome three experts on international trade to explore the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, and discuss the ramifications of this new agreement, particularly on the U.S. economy. I don't know about you, but the signing of the RCEP, RCEP on November 15th of this year caught me by surprise. Living in Asia for most of the past 20 years, I studiously tracked the developments and the negotiations for the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And I looked forward to the day that the TPP was going to be ratified by the US government. In the background, I heard talk of this alternative agreement, the RCEP, and to me, it seemed almost like a ploy by China to counter the TPP. Quite frankly, I didn't pay much attention to its progress. So when the agreement was signed last month, I had to dig into it to try and understand its contents and what it might mean for the US economy. I'm sure that many of you on this call had a similar reaction. So today, to try and answer some of your questions about the RCEP, we'll have experts explain a little bit about its history and some of the key elements of the agreement. Then we'll talk through the potential impact on supply chains, on the economies of the nations in and outside the RCEP, and of course, we'll touch upon the political ramifications. Before we start though, let me introduce you to our organization. I'll make a few housekeeping notes and then I'll turn it over to our moderator. Today's sponsoring organization is the Washington State China Relations Council. We're the oldest state level organization dedicated to improving ties between Washington State and China. Founded in 1979, right after Deng Xiaoping visited Seattle, we're a membership organization that includes businesses, governments, cultural and educational entities, as well as individuals with an interest in China. Our activities include producing educational programs, managing delegations from China, consulting with state and local governments about their interactions with China, and working with the local Chinese community here in our state. We produce or co-produce webinars on topics of interest to our members. This is our last planned webinar for 2020. We've already put together a schedule for 2021. I'd encourage you to go to our website to see what's in store for next year. Lastly, I'd like to mention that our 41-year-old model of relying totally on memberships to fund our operations is no longer sustainable. With the slowing of the trade and investment relationship with China, our membership has decreased. We'd ask those of you who enjoy our productions and who are not members to support us through donating to our sister organization, which is called the Washington State China Relations Fund. This is a 501c3 organization that can issue tax deductible receipts for any donations received. Details of how to donate are available on the website for the fund, and that's wscrf.org. So now let me introduce our moderator, and in turn, he will introduce our panelists. Our moderator today is Edward or Ted Alden, the Ross Distinguished Visiting Professor at the College of Business and Economics at Western Washington University. He's also a senior fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations in Washington, DC. An author, his most recent book is called The Failure to Adjust, While Americans Got Left Behind in the Global Economy. His first book, which was called The Closing of the American Border, Terrorism, Immigration, and Security Since 9-11, was very well recognized and a finalist for the J. Anthony Lucas Book Prize. Ted has testified to Congress many times, He's written for major newspapers, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. And he's appeared on the major networks, CNN, CNBC, NSNBC, Fox, et cetera. Just prior to joining the council, uh, Mr. Alden was the Washington Bureau Chief for the Financial Times. So a few housekeeping notes. Our panelists will discuss the topic for 30 or 40 minutes, then we'll go to Q&A. Please submit your questions to the chat box and our moderator will try his best to get to all the questions. And of course, please keep yourself on mute throughout the session. And lastly, we are recording today's event in case you want to review it later or share it with your friends. The recording is available on WSCRC's YouTube channel and the link to that channel will be posted in the chat box. Note that it takes about 24 hours until the, uh, the recording is posted uh, on, on the uh, on the link. Again, thanks everyone for participating and let's get started. Ted, uh, I'll turn it over to you. 
Great. Uh, thank you very much, Nora, and uh, thanks to the Washington State China Relations Council for hosting a very timely event on uh, RCEP. That's easier for me to say than RCEP on RCEP and the future of trade relations in the Asia Pacific. I am delighted to be joined for this important discussion by Matthew Goodman and Badri Narayan Gopalakrishnan. I, I stumble over that a bit. I will try that again. Gopalakrishnan, welcome to you both. Um, Matt is the William E. Simon Chair in Political Economy at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, and my go-to guy on all things having to do with uh, U.S. economic policy towards Asia. He was previously director for international economics uh, on the White House National Security Council staff, where he played key roles in both APEC and G20 summits. Um, Badri is an economist here in Washington State who does large-scale modeling on the impacts of international trade agreements, uh, among others as part of the Global Trade Analysis Project. He is a senior fellow at the European Center for International Political Economy and a research fellow uh, here at the University of Washington. So welcome to you both. Thank you for, uh, for taking the time to be with us this afternoon. So as Nora suggests, I'm gonna ask questions for about 30 minutes or so to bring out some of the big issues and then we will open it up to everyone else and you can post your questions in the chat as, as we go along. Um, we're here today to talk about the significance of the RCEP, which, which as Nora mentioned, really kind of snuck up on all of us. Um, as our guests will explain further and if you got here earlier, you saw that lovely map that, uh, that Mon posted at the beginning. RCEP is a regional trade agreement. The negotiations began roughly in 2011 as an initiative from the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN. Uh, is concluded and involves 15 countries, uh, including China, South Korea, and Japan. Uh, India was involved in the negotiations, but pulled out last year. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, like a lot of folks in the trade world, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention as, as RCEP was being negotiated. TPP was supposed to be the new gold standard and the RCEP talks seemed to be moving slowly and not covering much ground. But then of course, Donald Trump pulls the United States out of TPP in 2017. And when uh, the RCEP nations announced their deal last month, they uh, became overnight the uh, largest uh, trade bloc in, uh, in history. So Matt, let's uh, start with you. Tell us a little bit more about the history of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership uh, and how it came together. And again, thanks to you both for being here. Sure, well, thanks Ted and thanks Nora and, and uh, delighted to be here and greetings from the other Washington, the one that you wouldn't want to be locked down in, in a pandemic. Um, delighted to be with you all. Um, so, um, look, the, 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 the impulse uh, for regional economic integration in uh, East Asia, let's, let's say, or the broader Asia-Pacific region, um, has been around for, you know, for decades. Um, and um, it is um, pulled by, or dri driven by, obviously, a, 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 an interest in, uh, in trade and investment um, across uh, this this vast um, uh, area, accounting for about you know plus or minus a third of mankind and the third of the world economy, um, the U.S. Um, has been a player in that. But but uh, what's interesting about this agreement is that it's an Asian only agreement. Uh, the U.S. is a Pacific power, but not an Asian country. Um, this brings together, as Ted said, uh, 15 Asian countries. It was really driven initially, I think, by, um, by the ASEAN, Southeast Asian countries, who had individual trade agreements with a lot of the other partners, uh, but didn't, um, uh, I guess all of them actually, but, but uh, this was a, an attempt to try to rationalize all of that and make ASEAN the center of this sort of network of, of countries in this, in this broad region. Um, you know, there was a little bit of strategery going on um, between uh, different players here uh, where, um, you know, the sort of balancing effort uh, by the ASEANs with different uh, wooing partners, whether, you know, China, Korea, Japan, all of whom have been very active in the region um, as investors and traders, um, you know, Australia, New Zealand, India in its own way, which Badri will talk about. Um, and so I think this was an effort to try to, in a very ASEAN Asian way, to bring everybody together and, and try to rationalize uh, uh, this agreement. Um, you know, we can talk about what's in it and what it, why, why it matters, but that's sort of 
the, the backdrop. And one, I guess one other thing is obviously there is TPP and that was envisaged already, um, though not really, um, uh, hadn't gotten very far in 2011, but it had started under the Obama administration. And um, this was in some ways a, an alternative, but that's complicated because there was a lot of overlap in the, in the membership and uh, it's not exactly a, a rival uh, forum. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Matt. Um, uh, Badri, um, talk to us a little bit about the best predictions for the economic impacts of the RCEP. I mean, tell us a bit first, you know, what does it do, uh, particularly on the tariff side, because this seems to be primarily a tariff reduction deal. What does it do on the tariff side and what sorts of economic impacts is that likely to have uh, in the region? Uh, thank you, Ted, and and I thank uh, Washington State uh, China Relations Council for organizing this and inviting me. Uh, thanks to Nor and Man. Uh, so when it comes to the 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 tariff uh, reductions, which are the main uh, aspects of this uh, this deal, as uh, both of you mentioned, uh, Ted and Matt, uh, the the I think you've gone mute. Sorry, uh, there was some disturbance. So, yeah, uh, given that the um, uh, tariff reduction is the main part of this deal, uh, we don't have uh, any other deep integration aspects like uh, you know non-tariff barriers or uh, you know data. Uh, there is a little bit of data uh, related aspects, but mostly, uh, mostly it's tariff reduction, tariff elimination. So given uh, the focus being on tariff reduction elimination, uh, uh, the, and, and, and even there, there has been uh, a focus on specific uh, sectors. Uh, basically, uh, the sensitive sectors uh, in agriculture in particular uh, have been um, you know, out of the tariff reduction. So most of the tariff reductions are in the, the manufacturing sectors. And even there, there have been some exceptions. So, on an average, around 92% of uh, uh, you know the, the the tariff cuts are happening in 92% of sectors in the economy, in in, in all, all these countries. So, and and this this appears like 8% of the tariff lines seem uh, it, it appears like a small uh, number in terms of number of uh, disaggregated sectors, uh, but in in reality, it is um, um, uh, it, it it's actually uh, pretty large in terms of uh, you know when when the trade deals are happening, countries look for uh, uh, you know certain key sectors which are otherwise not very open, and these are those sectors. These these eight this eight percent that you see, these are the left out sectors which are which are usually the big deal. So these are the big deal sectors which are actually left out. So in that sense, uh, the agreement itself is uh, uh, it, it, it's probably a great uh, you know uh, kind of a geopolitical development and. Um, um, you know, like a big boost globally as a trade block, and maybe in the future the sensitive sectors may may also be uh, you know negotiated to uh, you know for tariff reduction later on. Uh, but at the moment, uh, given that uh, the, the, these key sectors are are left out, um, um, you know the, the the impact is not super high. Uh, so I did a, a some impact analysis, uh, you know, looking at. You know, even if you reduce all tariffs, if you reduce all the tariffs in between these countries, uh, the, the impact is around, uh, you know, a quarter a quarter uh, uh, of a percent to half a percent of, of GDP in many of these countries. That's, that's the impact you're looking at. But given that uh, some of these key sectors are left out, the impact is uh, even lower. It, it's, uh, it's something like 0.1 percent, 0.2 percent increase in GDP for many of these countries. Uh, and um, in terms of the countries that are not part of it, like you know India uh, and, and US and so on, so it's going to be there is going to be some trade diversion. Uh, so these countries are going to grab uh, a lot of exports to uh, each other and also to the you know, third countries because of some integration in the supply chains, uh, and that is going to uh, eat into the the trade of you know exports of uh, the, the the other major countries which are which are big players in this region. Uh, and and that, that there uh, we see something like uh, a few billion dollars uh, loss in terms of trade and and in terms of GDP. So it's not it's not uh, huge numbers we are talking about, but 
but it's more uh, it's more about the this this whole uh, you know uh, the ecosystem the ecosystem that is created and then and then that may further lead into uh, you know deeper integration later and and i think uh, at a later point in this discussion i'll i'll also talk about how you know what's the deal about india why uh, india was a major uh, in, india was one uh, important reason for this uh, rcep for for all the other rcep members because uh, india is kind of relatively more closed compared to others and everyone wanted market access there um, and and india backed out and we, we can uh, we'll be talking about that later but this is the broad you know big picture yeah so we will we will absolutely come back to you just one very quick follow on Badri, do you, do you have any sense of whether there are supply chain implications? Are we going to see any shifting in industrial location decisions, maybe in autos, which is one of the sectors that'll be more affected? Is it, is it too early to make those kind of predictions? Or, or can we, you know, where there's, there's a lot of movement going on in, in Asia right now, a lot of it away from China to Vietnam because of the trade uh, tensions that are on. Any sense of whether RCEP has an effect on that one way or another? Yeah, uh, uh, on that, um, the, the definitely there is some investment effect of uh, these, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, tariff reductions. Uh, there are two types of effects. One is uh, uh, when the tariffs are high, uh, like if you take India, for example, when the tariffs have been high um, uh, historically and uh, when the investment barriers are, uh, you know, gone, uh, then, you know, there are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, companies go to such countries uh, to uh, to take advantage of the domestic market and get the enjoy the protection while being part of the domestic supply chain. Uh, I think I think that that kind of investments uh, are going to be less incentivized because the tariffs are reduced, so there is no um, you know incentive for these countries to invest in each other. They they can just trade staying where they are. Uh, however, um, uh, you know for example the, the countries that are that have close ties close economic ties with these uh, RCEP members uh, they may uh, they may see uh, some kind of uh, a benefit of um, you know uh, setting up uh, factories in these countries uh, so this also ties in with what you just mentioned about uh, companies moving away from China to uh, some of the other Southeast Asian countries uh, uh, um, I think uh, again here um, uh, India could be a little bit of a loser because uh, l l there has been a lot of talk of uh, these companies going to uh, India among these other countries and and that may be affected because uh, India wouldn't have that much of a market access with many other countries so it doesn't make a lot of sense to start up a factory there and uh, so so that's that's the overall you know, supply chain effect so it's it's good there is going to be some supply chain impact but it's again going to impact the non-members more than the, the members. The members are probably going to benefit more. Yeah, I mean, it may uh, may well help Vietnam in that respect. Matt, let's let's talk about China for a little bit because I mean, mostly when we think about RCEP, we think you know it, it, the way the media writes about it. You know, this is a, a trade agreement with China at the center. Why did China want to get involved in this, and and what are the potential advantages for China with this deal having been concluded? Well, again, I mean, you, you go back um, to the origins of this, the, um, all of the big players, particularly the Northeast Asian countries, China, Japan, Korea, um, had been um, uh, investing in and trading with the, this important collective block of Southeast Asian countries. And um, in some sense, were um, uh, hoping to uh, increase that that uh, interaction. They had bilateral FTAs, but they wanted to sort of try to integrate that region and play into um, ASEAN's desire to try to um, connect the region better uh, economically. Um, you know, there's, there's definitely an economic dimension, but I'd say the strategic, you know, aspect as well is important where you, you know, you have these, these uh, three countries and to some extent the United States, which we can talk about, um, uh, uh, vying for, for, for um, and, and India in its own way, which Badri has mentioned, which I can also say something about, but um, trying to um, establish a more favored position vis-a-vis uh, -vis this, this part of the world. And the ASEANs, you know, really played into that and were appealing to, uh, you know, separately China, Japan, uh, and Korea, big investor in Vietnam and other parts of Southeast Asia, um, you know, to, to sort of join them in this effort um, and, but then there was a sort of period when China and Japan were kind of competing over this, 
uh, this role of, 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 of leading um, the charge with, with ASEAN. And, um, and it resulted in bringing in the other, the other players, uh, Japan in particular, pulled, pushed to get Australia, New Zealand, and, and India into the room to help balance some of the, the, um, their perception that China was going to dominate this grouping. Um, so, I mean, you know, economically, because your question sort of implies, in some ways, you know, there's a disadvantage to China, as you were suggesting, you know, this, this other things being equal is probably going to um, accentuate the trend of movement of investment out of China, because now you can produce, you know, in Southeast Asia or, you know, various parts of Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, as long as you meet the, the fairly low threshold of 40% content within this block, of your product, you can sell it into China without having to actually, um, you know, produce there. So, um, you know, so it's interesting from that perspective that China has been, uh, you know, been so interested in this, but it's, you know, those effects are counterbalanced by the fact that there's more trade, more investment, and this sort of strategic advantage, or, or at least keeping up with the Joneses of other countries trying to establish uh, favored positions with, um, with Southeast Asia. I was muted there. Just a just a quick follow. Um, do you think that that Beijing has a kind of coherent overall strategy here? Because of course, at the recent party plenum, the you know the new buzzword is dual circulation, which is essentially a way of saying that China is going to focus more internally uh, to generate growth, be less dependent on exports, and yet at the same time, you know, the, we've got the new uh, RCEP. China's talking about maybe joining the CPTPP. Is there a coherent strategy there or are these just a bunch of different strands that, that may or may not line up at some point? I think there's a big vision um, and ambition uh, to, to both do what they have to do internally. I mean, they really do have to move to a more consumption-led, domestic demand-driven growth model because the, uh, you know, the, the advantages or, or uh, dividends from this uh, heavy investment export led growth model are, are diminishing. So, um, so that's a real impulse, but so is the impulse to, uh, you know, to uh, expand their uh, influence uh, economically and diplomatically and, you know, from a security perspective as well in their near abroad. Um, you know, charitably, to be fair to China, you know, they have 18 countries around them that haven't always been um, friendly and, and they're trying to sort of on some level just to ensure that there's uh, peace and stability around them. Um, but, um, but, you know, if you're a little more cynical, uh, they're trying to establish, you know, kind of a Sinocentric pattern of, of trade investment and, um, you know, and broader uh, engagement, uh, which, you know, if you really want to be um, um, cynical, you know, is trying to reestablish, you know, sort of a Tang dynasty or Ming Dynasty um, pattern of, of affairs. Um, but that may be a little too far in terms of what the actual strategy here is. Um, so I think it's, they're trying to have it both ways and, and do, do all of the, have their cake and eat it. And um, you know, it may be possible, especially if the United States is not playing. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Matt. I see questions starting to come into the chat, so please keep putting those in there and we will, we will get to them. Um, I wanna turn to the sort of the two big countries that are on the outside of this, the United States and, and India. And Padre, let's start with, uh, with India. Why did India walk away from the talks? And, and let me ask you to put on a policy advisor hat. If you were advising the Modi government, what would you suggest uh, should be India's next steps in terms of its trade strategy towards the, the broader region? Uh, so yeah, uh, thanks. Ed. Uh, India has uh, always um, uh, suffered from uh, this this uh, chicken and egg problem. Um, like when it comes to uh, opening up uh, external markets, they talk about you know domestic markets not being ready, and uh, and when it comes to uh, you know uh, in increasing efficiency, the domestic market uh, infrastructure and so on, uh, there is a need for uh, you know competition from outside like you, know, you need to have an open trade so there's always this this debate policy debate happening there whenever whenever uh, trade uh, as a topic comes up um, uh, we, we worry a lot about the 
the domestic producers, what will happen to farmers, what will happen to uh, industries. We have a lot of small industries, uh, they're going to lose and so on. So that, that, that was a typical issue here as well. Uh, and it was quite interesting uh, the way it evolved. Like initially, India was very much uh, you know, part of it and uh, quite upbeat about it. In fact, the uh, Prime Minister Modi had a lot of, uh, like uh, he, he put in a lot of political capital, capital in it and he was actually hoping to end his previous uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, regime, the, the previous uh, government uh, uh, which ended in 2019 uh, on a note of joining RCEP. He wanted this to be uh, like a like a symbolic uh, uh, show of strength of India globally that we are we are we are now open to trade that kind of like making a statement kind of thing uh, and there was a lot of back and forth and uh, the different ministries uh, who were influential in this uh, one of the uh, the previous uh, you know commerce ministers he was very uh, upbeat about it and very very positive and that was going forward. And uh, there were a lot of consultations, domestic consultations with the, with the industry and consumers and so on. And uh, there, a lot of concerns were raised by, you know, farmers, agricultural sectors, and also by some of the industrial manufacturing sectors saying that this is, they, they thought of it as mainly as like an India-China free trade agreement. And, and, uh, and India has always been uh, a bit um, uh, cautious when it comes to relations with China, either economic or political so that the all these things played out and, and india already has a large trade deficit with china and again the indian policymakers always think in terms of trade deficit when it comes to a trade agreement rather than uh, you know the the, the the economic impact uh, so these these are all uh, the different factors and and my, like putting like the, the the thing that you asked me if i were uh, an advisor and, and i did contribute to some of the analysis that was done there um, uh, like what my, my uh, thought would be that to to go on all this simultaneously because it, it is true that it is very true that if uh, India opens up right away there there's going to be a lot of damage in the domestic market but that should not be the reason to keep it close closed so you have to push reforms you may be uh, looking at in the news nowadays there, there's a lot of protests happening in India for some of the recent reforms in the agricultural sector so it's not easy uh, to reform the Indian market. Uh, the politic it needs a lot of political strength and willpower and uh, so on. But but that has to happen. So I think you have to push on both of these simultaneously. But I think one uh, positive thing for India is that it's still not uh, late. Uh, the RCEP members have provided uh, one year uh, time for India to join. India can still uh, think of joining. And I I feel like. That that is a that is a there is a little possibility of that happening, and that could be one reason why the government is pushing for a lot of domestic reforms. So this whole concept of self-reliant India that the prime minister is promoting is about strengthening the domestic markets uh, um, uh, to be able to uh, you know be competitive in the global global market. So I think if these things happen uh, the way they are happening now, and if the government is strong and uh, somehow uh, you know manages all these protests and so on uh, probably they can be part of ourself at some point of time um, but yeah but that's that's the uh, it's a lot of uh, political and economic uh, challenges that that led to india coming out of it finally. Very, very good thank you that was a superb answer um we've got a lot of good questions coming in so matt i'm going to make this the last question for me and then we'll we'll turn to some of the questions coming out in the chat so so badri's comments about you know a country that's uh, worried about trade deficits obviously uh, reminds us of a particular country, which is our own. So what the heck does the United States do? I mean, I suppose we still have APEC, but I mean, what are the challenges that uh, the U.S. is going to face in the upcoming administration in trying to reestablish its economic presence in this region? And similar question, what would you advise uh, for the Biden administration in terms of a strategy going forward? Yeah, it's a real tension for the Biden administration because um, on the one hand, just broadly, they, they have made clear they're going to focus on the domestic economic uh, rebuilding. And that's for good reason, because we are, you know, really need, need that. Uh, but even if there weren't a pandemic, I think uh, they, they would be prioritizing domestic reinvestment over international. Um, and more specifically on trade, I think there's a real reluctance to take on the difficult politics of trade in the near term. 
Um, so that on the one hand, on the other hand, the, this tension comes because, you know, because a, a we, uh, and I think particularly President Biden gets the importance of the United States engaging in the world and institutions it, with allies, uh, particularly in an important part of the world like the Asia Pacific. Um, and he um, understands, I think, that uh, to be credible as a player in the region, as I said, the United States is a Pacific player, but it's not, a, it's not an Asian country. So we, we earn our stripes as, as Asia Pacific citizens by, yes, our military presence there, and let's not kid ourselves, everybody, and frankly, until recently, including China, wanted the U.S. there as a military power because we provided the peace and, and stability that allowed people to get on with growth. Um, but they don't only want us there for that. That's very awkward <laughs> to have us only there as a security uh, presence. And so economics is critical. And, I, and the Biden team is going to have to come up with some sort of credible economic strategy for this critical region. You know, rejoining TPP or CPTPP, as it's now called, um, would be the obvious choice if you were just focused on that, because uh, it is a very powerful um, device of our strategic engagement and you know regional economic integration and establishing rules of the road. Um, but that's clearly not going to happen in the short term. Um, uh, you know, I think probably the Biden people, and this is what I would, I mean, I would maybe advise them if I were doing this to find a way to signal an intent to get back on that path to TPP. But, um, but in the meantime, focus on some important elements of economic rulemaking that still are not fully developed. So one in particular is in the digital governance space, rules and norms for um, um, the internet, for the handling of data. Uh, there's a lot to build on there because you have um, TPP itself, you have the US-Mexico-Canada agreement, which has even you know, better rules on digital um, um, commerce. Um, you have the U.S.-Japan bilateral uh, digital agreement, uh, which is also uh, uh, pretty robust. Um, and you have a lot of good work in APEC on uh, cross-border privacy rules and um, other elements of this. So if I were them, I think I'd at least try to say, let's, you know, I'd go to the partners in the region and say, let's, let's pull all this together and try and take it to the next level as some kind of uber um, uh, digital agreement, which is something different from, you know, what Europe's offering or what, China's offering. Um, and, you know, but then I think it's going to have to be other things as well, working, you know, some kind of credible infrastructure policy in the region, um, development strategy, um, you know, and as I say, probably ultimately, I think signaling some sort of um, commitment or renewed commitment to be an active part of broader regional economic integration, which the U.S. has been since 1989, at least when we helped found APEC, um, and but have abandoned in the last few years. Um, so it's something that we really have to get back on track with. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Matt. Nor, do you want me to just read out the questions on the chat here, or would you prefer to have people ask them directly? Or I, let me unmute myself. No, I'd, I'd uh, read out them, and you can okay. you can summarize them a little bit. Sounds good. If yeah, if people if people want to ask their questions directly, just you know use the little hand signal or or otherwise you know or turn your camera on and let me know. I'd be happy to go to you. So the the first question we have is from Carl Weaver, and it actually comes out quite uh, uh, seamlessly on your comments, Matt, about a digital agreement. Question is, how would you avoid technology decoupling between the United States? in China. Are there concrete steps that that can be taken to avoid a path that it kind of looks like we're going down? Maybe Matt, I'll start with you, Badri, if you want to, if you have thoughts on that too, please, uh, please let me know. But, but how do we avoid technology decoupling? Yeah, well, I mean, full decoupling isn't going to happen and doesn't make sense, but some decoupling is happening um, uh, as a result of, um, you know, both private sector decisions and, you know, policy. Uh, you know, the, the Trump administration has been moving pretty aggressively to um, control technology transfer to protect, you know, uh, supply chains uh, in telecommunications and so on, you know, by banning Huawei um, through, through other means, um, is stepping up our investment screening and, and export control laws. Um, and uh, I think a lot of that is going to continue under a Biden administration. 
probably a little more nuanced um, uh, in the sense that, for example, Huawei, you know, definitely is not going to be selling equipment into the U.S. Uh, network uh, under a Biden administration. But, you know, commoditized chips or other products being sold by American producers or third parties to Huawei, they might have a more nuanced approach to that. Um, uh, but, um, but I think the, those trends are there. There's a very strong uh, impulse in Congress on both sides of the aisle uh, to try to uh, minimize or reduce our technological interdependence. Meanwhile, in China, partly driven as a response to that, but also for their own reasons, uh, they are, and you alluded to the dual circulation strategy, a lot of which is about technological self-reliance. Uh, you know, China's realized that it's, it's too dependent on um, on the rest of us, um, and you know, but but even again, without the Trump trade war and all of that, or tech war, I think China would be moving. It's trying to get up the value chain and be uh, able to produce a lot of this stuff itself. So it's, these trends are kind of there and are happening. And I, I don't think RCEP or TPP or anything else is going to fundamentally affect uh, those those trends. Um, it's suboptimal if we end up with you know two or three or four internets, because um, we haven't really talked about Europe, but they've got another approach as well to a lot of this stuff. Um, and so, you know, that would obviously be suboptimal, but I think we have to expect that there's going to be um, a movement in that direction um, over, you know, the next several years. Yeah, very much. And, and you know, the Europeans are now making a big play to try to see if they, can get on the same page with the United States or, or more actually have the United States get on the same page with them. Big overture from the, yes, we'll from the commission to the Biden transition team. We'll see how that goes. Um, but a, a question actually, let me ask you this next question. And if you want to add anything on the digital side, go ahead. Cause the, the next question is kind of a natural for you. Uh, and it comes from Derek Meng. He's asking um, about, you know, is there concern in China that high end manufacturing in Korea and Japan is going to put a lot of pressure on uh, Chinese manufacturing companies that are trying to move up the value chain? Or is this a, a sign of growing confidence in China that its manufacturing companies can compete successfully on a, on a region-wide basis? Great. Uh, so uh, just to add to what Matt said, I completely agree with Matt on uh, uh, a couple of uh, points there is, uh, like one is that, uh, you know, uh, when I did some analysis on the US-China trade tensions and the impact on the ICT sector, particularly information communication technology, I found that uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, there's going to be substantial impact in, in both countries and US would be a slightly larger uh, loser here because we depend a lot, you know, it's, it's a, it's a two-way trade. Like if we, we restrict some technologies and we also lose some market in China. So, so that's, that's one, one aspect. And the second aspect is also there is also a discussion, like uh, like you rightly pointed out, how EU, uh, EU and and other countries are also you know, joining hands in this, and 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 there is also a possibility of uh, uh, in in certain niche technologies where uh, security is paramount and some of the other you know non non economic aspects are important that there could be some collaboration with between the other countries and 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 in that sense there could be like enough scale for innovation and, and, and competition uh, uh, with uh, with limited engagement with China. But having said all this, uh, like again, going back to Matt's first point that uh, decoupling is not possible uh, in a large way because we are, we are so interdependent that it's, it's not going to uh, matter, you know, uh, happen practically. So coming back to this particular question, this really interesting question on how, uh, you know, China, uh, China is going to face competition from Korea and Japan. Uh, I, I actually already feel like um, uh, when I when I look at some of the developments in manufacturing sectors and the technologies in China, uh, read a little bit about it and some some field surveys we did with with my university colleagues, uh, we find that you know China is quite advanced in uh, manufacturing already in in, in many cases. Uh, for example, uh, in, in some kind of uh, you know less. You know, less uh, important sectors like you know furniture, furniture manufacturing, which we don't talk about much. And there, there are factories in China which are completely automated. They, they have you know uh, completely automated with little labor. So gone are the days when we talked about uh, China as a cheap labor, low low labor cost economy. It's actually 
that labor costs have increased a lot because of the increase in standard of living, but it has moved into high tech innovation and so on. So I, I think uh, in that sense, China is quite mature and I, I, I feel like it's a sign of China's confidence in domestic, domestic manufacturers as the, as you know, direct puts it in the question. Uh, I think they are, they're willing to, and, and I think it's kind of like the, the opposite of what India is thinking, like by opening up, uh, you challenge the domestic manufacturers to live up to, up to the standards and, and, and get more, uh, more out of it. And also the other thing is, uh, you know, they, they can also do more collaborations. They can, they're, they're going to get more market in Korea and Japan um, uh, and they can become part of the supply chain. And, and, and in that process, they can gradually upgrade over time. So, yeah, my answer is uh, pretty positive on that question. So China is, I think, confident. Excellent. Uh, thank you. A great question and a, and a great answer. Um, Matt, uh, there's a question from Gary Ogan about the, the, the TPP, uh, which, of course, included, um, you know, North American or, or America's nations, you know, Peru and Mexico and Canada and, and others. And it's a question kind of about strategy under the TPP. China was, of course, not part of the TPP negotiations. But, you know, as you and I have talked about a lot, there were elements of the TPP, like those on state-owned enterprises, that were uh, intended in some way to set down a marker for perhaps China eventually joining. What, what are the dynamics we're, we're, we're talking about now? I mean, has the U.S. lost all the potential leverage uh, it had in the, in the initial TPP structure? I mean, I, I, I can't exactly formulate the, the, the question here, but, but you know, you've got China on one side saying it wants in, the U.S. on the other side saying, well, the domestic politics don't really fit. What's the dynamic right now in, in terms of, of TPP? How much does it matter going forward in setting the rules for trade in the region? Um, Gary, I apologize. I expanded your question there a little bit. But. Um, well, TPP, I mean, I think still matters. And, and uh, it definitely is um, a broader um, uh, and deeper agreement that, that goes further on, on some of the key rules that don't exist or are not strong enough in the international trade trading system and the regional trading system for sure so um so it's it's still important it's still got 11 you know significant um countries in it um starting with japan um and australia and singapore and 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 uh, uh, several other members who are also in rcep and they feel it's still important to have that separate agreement and they want to bring others into it so uh they're talking to the uk the uk's got some other problems it's got to sort out first and in the next couple of weeks at least um before they can consider that but um it's talking to korea the other day president moon in korea said that he's interested in joining tpp um thailand philippines others have been mentioned over time um and so I think there's very much a, uh, a still a TPP track here. Um, as for China's interest or Xi Jinping's statement the other day about wanting to join, I don't take that very seriously as a substantive matter. I mean, China's got, would, would have to do way more than it's willing to do right now uh, to meet the standards of TPP, as you said, in areas like state-owned enterprises or subsidies, but even in the digital area or general good, you know, um, regulatory practices. There's a whole bunch of stuff in uh, TPP that'd be really difficult for China to accept. But symbolically, strategically, I think that's what he was doing. He's signaling that, hey, we're playing the game. You know, we just did this big thing with all these other Asian countries. You know, we're willing to consider uh, joining this thing. Um, and uh, I'll come to the US. Let me just say one other thing about China, which is kind of interesting historically, um, and the dynamics changed, but it's interesting sort of background. You know, in 2013, when, when the U.S. And, um, and 10 other uh, countries in the Asia Pacific were negotiating um, TPP, Japan um, was very eager to join, and they ultimately did join when Prime Minister Abe came back in in um, 2000, late 2012, early 2013. And at that time, Xi Jinping had just come into power in China. And there was a brief moment when there was clearly um, a, a look at the question of doubling down on reform and opening. And I think the TPP at that time was clearly a force that was driving a conversation within China about reform. Um, I was there shortly after, as it happens, Abe gave a speech at CSIS in which he said, Japan's back and we're gonna join TPP. And a Chinese scholar who had always said TPP is designed to exclude China said, I think China should join TPP. And I was just shocked. Um, and it's because there was a debate going on. I think that's long since passed because Xi Jinping made another choice 
Um, so I don't think it's, it's a live thing today, but that dynamic is there hidden sort of under the surface in China. Um, you know, as for the U.S., we, we have to, as I say, signal that we're going to be part of this effort somehow. Um, we chose our lot with TPP originally, and I think we need to find a way to get back to it. Um, and I think we will. I mean, I still think 10 years from now, the U.S. is probably going to be in something like TPP or some regional, you know, broader agreement with a different name. But um, it, it's just going to not happen in the next you know, year. There's going to be other things that Biden's uh, focused on. They got to start signal signaling, though. Excellent. Thank you. Um, next question, um, Badri, and I might, I might weigh in on this uh, briefly, too, from the U.S. end, because it's something I've thought about quite a lot. It was a, it's a question from Michael Fowler about labor and environmental standards in, in trade agreements. Um, there was a fair bit in the TPP at U.S. insistence, particularly with respect to Vietnam. The new NAFTA, the USMCA, has pretty robust labor standards, particularly in relation to Mexico. The question is, how can countries like Japan and Australia join uh, the RCEP when their labor and environmental costs would uh, suggest that they're on, uh, you know, to use the, the favorite EU metaphor these days, on an unlevel playing field? So, so why, why is this not a bigger concern for the advanced economies that are part of RCEP, that they're going to lose investment to, to countries with weaker standards that's been so central to the U.S. trade agenda? Yeah, uh, yeah, this is a great question. And, and uh, in the context of, uh, you know, TPP, uh, I did some work on how, uh, you know, TPP is setting standards for, uh, you know, other trade agreements and also the non-members. And, and that's, that's kind of going to the previous question as well to some extent. Um, even though uh, countries that are not uh, countries are not part of uh, TPP, they they like for example India. Uh, one of the uh, thoughts was to for them to get ready with this, all these standards. Like even before, even even though you are not part of it, you don't have any uh, you know uh, uh, kind of commitment to do that. It's better to do that because and, and uh, in some way or the other, it's going to affect you. Uh, in this context, um, uh, this particular questions context, I think. The, um, uh, the two, two broad answers. One is, uh, this is in no way, uh, RCEP is in no way a deep trade, a free trade agreement. It's a very, very kind of shallow, uh, just uh, tariffs. And so uh, Australia and Japan uh, have already done whatever they could to protect their sensitive sectors that are likely to be affected. With, and those are the sectors where these standards matter a lot, labor and environmental costs. And, and on the other uh, things, which is in trade, it's always give and take. So they are getting a huge, you know, market access, uh, you know, to China and, and many of these other countries, um, which uh, which other uh, which wouldn't have been possible other uh, uh, other way. And all the countries have played their cards in terms of what sectors to open, what sectors to close. Uh, so these these things have been already considered by them. So they've they've taken into account the, the labor cost and environmental cost uh, aspect. And also the other aspect is even uh, outside all these trade agreements. Uh, uh, these countries have already kind of specialized in, um, you know, uh, sectors that are, uh, you know, that are more capital intensive. And uh, I think environmental uh, uh, protection is still a question. But when it comes to labor, that's not a major issue because they've already gone away, uh, uh, away from labor, more into capital. Uh, on environmental uh, protection, uh, yeah, that's that's a, that's an important question and. Uh, uh, again, again, uh, uh, this this has not been explicitly taken into account in the agreement, but but uh, they have uh, you know protected certain sectors that that would that would uh, uh, that would uh, face these kind of challenges. Uh, but having said all that, uh, I, I do think that uh, that that's an issue. Uh, I really like the kind of deep agreements like TPP, where all these things are taken into consideration. Uh, so that that is an open question. To what extent? Uh, the the environmental aspect particularly is going to affect um, affect these countries. Uh, there's this kind of race to the bottom, uh, pollution havens, these kind of things. How are they going to uh, affect um, you know Australia and Japan? Uh, so that that's still an open question. But but when it comes to labor, it's kind of uh, relatively straightforward. Thank you. That's a that's a great answer. I hadn't thought about the way in which maintaining tariffs in some of these sensitive sectors sort of serves as an effective substitute for labor and environmental standards and trade agreements. I'm just going to make one quick comment on the domestic politics here, which I, I've paid a lot of attention to. I think one of the things that's going to make it really difficult for the Biden administration to get back into TPP is that the expectations 
on labor and environmental standards in agreements keep getting ratcheted up. If you look at the new USMCA and the, and the woman who's gonna be the next US Trade Representative, Catherine Tai, was instrumental in pushing for this when she uh, was working as, as uh, the, the, the chief staffer for the House uh, Democrats on this issue. Um, you know, if the US wants to come back into TPP, it's gonna insist that countries meet the new USMCA standard, that's gonna be a huge negotiating lift. But if Biden doesn't do that, he's going to lose a lot of support from his own party. It's also an issue, I might add, with rules of origin. You know, Matt mentioned that the rules of origin are quite low in RCEP, roughly 40 percent. One of the big changes in the new NAFTA on the auto side was to create an even tighter rules of origin, 75 percent plus of auto content now needs to come from North America. This was a huge issue with the Japanese, as Matt knows, in the TPP negotiations. That's gonna be really hard if the US ever wants to, to get back in. I don't know how you finesse that one. Um, the next question here is from, from Noor, and I, and I think uh, this is probably uh, aimed, at, uh, aimed at you, Matt. And that's a question about the WTO. Um, do you think that the Biden administration is gonna lift the hold? on the appellate body, try to re-engage in the question of WTO reform and see if it can save the, the, the faded dispute settlement system? Yeah, I mean, that's a very specific question to which I can't give you a, a, an informed answer, um, but I can sort of broaden it a little bit by saying that I think that the Biden administration, I think the Catherine Tai um, um, nomination or, or designation is, um, is a signal that they, you know, they want to take um, trade policy seriously. I totally agree with you on those political constraints, particularly vis-a-vis -vis, uh, TPP. Um, and Catherine, you know, also exemplifies that. Uh, by the way, labor groups, Richard Trunka um, just, you know, tweeted that she's a great choice. And so, you know, I mean, it's clearly the politics are going to be very hard. Uh, but on the other hand, she's a serious trade person. And I think, you know, there's a lot of WTO stuff on the table this year. You have the new director general that needs to be um, named, which has been postponed because the Trump administration, you know, basically vetoed the candidate, the American candidate, I should say, uh, a Nigerian-American uh, uh, trade minister who's terrific. Um, uh, that I think the Biden people want to, want to go forward with that. I think they're going to want to get a, direct, a new director general in. Um, you know, there's a fisheries negotiation that is outstanding that has a deadline, you know, uh, or maybe the deadlines this year, but as always, these things get pushed off. Um, but that's that's sort of front and center. Um, there's a there's um, a ministerial, WTO ministerial mid to 2021. There's this Asia APEC dynamic um, on trade. Um, but and then the appellate body is sitting out there unresolved. I'm not optimistic. I mean, I think that, you know, remember Mike Froman, when he was USTR under Obama, second term, was pretty frustrated about, um, about the appellate body himself. Um, he didn't go so far as to blocking, you know, um, enough members to deny a quota. But it's, it's, you know, it's a real issue on both sides of the aisle. It's, it's a problem that um, this, even though it's Net, net benefited us more than it hasn't. It, it's been um, a, a problem, a thorn in the side of, of um, administrations from both sides of the aisle. So I don't think there's an easy solution to that. And then more fun, a final point is more fundamentally, look, I think the WTO has you know three basic uh, reasons to live, to exist, raison d'etre, which are negotiating new agreements and new rules, that ain't happening, um, uh, to enforce existing rules, and again, to the appellate body point, that isn't happening. Um, and, you know, a transparency provision that's, you know, not great either. So I think it's really hard to see how you, how you get over all of that. Um, and I suspect that the, the Biden people, they'll do the, 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 the basic work, they won't want to kill the WTO, but they're going to look for alternative, you know, approaches that bring uh, countries together in, in, um, in other groupings to try to get rules established, um, like a digital group, um, uh, to take those issues forward. Um, but um, so that's the best I can do. I can't tell you whether, you know, they'll hold, lift the block on a judge, maybe. I don't think anybody knows at this point. I had one last question that I want to ask that sort of takes off uh, from the WTO point. And I do encourage people, there are a couple of other excellent comments in the chat that just uh, build on this discussion a little bit. So please take a look at those. And uh, the question, I'll start with you, Badri, and then, and then maybe go to Matt to, to finish off. Um, you know, the RCMP, RCEP, the RCEP is one of many 
agreements that we have seen in recent years, both regional and bilateral, that fall miles short of the WTO standard, which says, sure, you can go out there and negotiate free trade agreements, but only as long as they cover substantially all trade. Clearly, RCEP doesn't cover substantially all trade. Certainly, the U.S.-Japan trade deal or the recent U.S. Ecuador deal don't cover substantially all trade. I want to ask you, you, you know, both about two things. What, what does this mean for the future of the global trading system? But from an economic perspective, you know, are we going to end up with a series of, of economically suboptimal trade agreements? I mean, what are the implications of continuing to go down this road? So, Padre, why don't we start with you here? Sure. Uh, sure, Ted. Uh, yeah, I think um, uh, so. What uh, we have been calling in the recent past, our current administration, outgoing U.S. administration calls as, you know, bilateral trade agreements based on the principle of mutual reciprocity, right? So that's that has become like kind of like whether you say or not, that's 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 what has been uh, uh, has been followed in many of these agreements. So, like you said, the gold standard of WTO is not followed. I, I think uh, there has been a lot of literature and discussion on whether these kind of agreements are a building block to a larger uh, global free trade kind of agreement or, or are these uh, stumbling blocks. And there is a lot of division, like people have different uh, opinions on that. Uh, but but uh, the very motivation for these agreements is, is that nothing much is moving on uh, in, in, at, at a global level with, with WTO and uh, in, in those forums because of you know, a lot of uh, disagreements among countries. So, so basically, you know, we we are like many of these governments are settling for like this something is better than nothing kind of thing like let's let's have some trade deal let's let's keep it going and and then eventually uh, the things can you know uh, firm up like like i talked about in terms of ourselves uh, but yeah i agree with you that uh, in some ways uh, you know in in the short term it's definitely uh, suboptimal because we would actually want uh, something larger uh, and, and we also want to go back to WTO because uh, that's where we can have uh, transparent discussions. You know, there is there are no like you know uh, blocks that are enmical towards each other and so on. So we can have a whole world sit together and talk transparently, uh, which still uh, you know appears very idealistic. But that's the way to go. Uh, so from that perspective, uh, this is quite suboptimal because countries are now encouraged to go on with a lot of these kind of agreements. Uh, but but I also I, I'm also I'm, I'm kind of an optimist in this regard. I, I feel like these these things can add up, and then then the countries can get the courage to sit together and go multilateral. But I do think that multilateral, um, uh, you know, multi-sectoral multilateral uh, trade deals are uh, far better than this kind of uh, you know focused uh, trade deals. Yeah, my uh, my former CFR colleague uh, Jagdish Bhagwati would have agreed with you on the suboptimal, but he would he would not have equivocated on uh, on their value. He called these deals termites in the trading system, and I think he had a point. Uh, Matt, I'm going to give you the uh, the final word on this. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm you know what do they say? What is the old thing about the old saw about a neocon as a as a as a liberal who got mugged? And that's how I feel about this topic is that, you know, I'm an idealist. I mean, and I think ideally, optimally, you want to do this stuff multilaterally, um, you know, as many people in the room, as many issues covered, you want to get as far as you can. But, you know, we're just obviously not in that world where that's going to be possible, especially with 180 countries around the room who have very different um, perspectives and interests and capabilities. Um, so I think I'm sort of pragmatic as well. I think you've got to start somewhere. And I do kind of, as Badri said at the end there, I think it's still better, even if there's a short-term economic um, uh, loss or, or less um, than, a, than, than ideal um, return from doing these things. You know, if you can, if you can get some countries to agree on some good rules, um, you can then build on that and and get that back into a multilateral framework eventually. I think that's the that's the way we're going to have to operate if we want to get anything done in practice. Yeah, thanks very much, Matt. Yeah, I always uh, teach my students about the various principles of the WTO, including the consensus principle. And the consensus principle sounds much better in theory than, than it tends to work out in practice. Um, look, I would like to thank you both for an incredibly uh, rich discussion. I think we covered a lot of ground. Uh, I feel much wiser. If there's any final one minute question, I'll take it. If not, I will uh, say thank you to everybody for, for being on the call here. And thank you, Nora. I'll turn it back to you. Okay. Uh, if there aren't any more questions, 
again, I think it was a great, great discussion. Thanks, Ted, very much for putting those good questions. And uh, of course, to Baudry and Matt for, uh, for your comments. Um, I guess I'll, I'll go away from this thinking that hopefully that our, our RCEP is a good building block and that we'll use it, uh, it'll be used to, to continue to build on the multilateral trading system. And of course, I think we're all very curious to see what happens with TPP, but as, as particularly as Matt said, it's it's not going to be something that's going to happen in the immediate future. So again, thanks thanks very much to Ted and our panelists. Uh, excellent discussion and very enlightening. I hope uh, everyone that was on uh, listening today uh, enjoyed it as well as I did. So again, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Thank Ted so much. and Norm. Thanks very much. Great to be with you all. Bye -bye. Okay. Bye-bye.